The UK announced new sanctions yesterday relating to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, targeting seven oligarchs with links to Vladimir Putin. Among them is Roman Abramovich, a Russian oligarch who grew wealthy following the collapse of the Soviet Union in Russia's controversial Loans for Shares privatization program. Abramovich was a confidant of former Russian President Boris Yeltsin and is reported to have been the first person to recommend to Yeltsin that former KGB agent and taxi driver Vladimir Putin be his successor as the Russian president. When Putin formed his first cabinet in 1999, Abramovich allegedly interviewed each of the candidates for cabinet positions before they were approved. This is the first time any Western government has targeted Abramovich. His trophy assets, including Chelsea Football Club, expensive homes in London and mega yachts, have helped turn him into one of the highest profile Russian oligarchs, who are now facing additional scrutiny from officials in the wake of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Abramovich has denied being close to Putin and says he has done nothing to deserve being sanctioned. But the UK alleges that he's closely involved with several Russian individuals and entities that have played a role in destabilizing and undermining Ukraine. And they say that he benefited financially from that involvement. Abramovich announced earlier this month that he was transferring stewardship and care of the club to the trustees of its charitable foundation, later announcing that he would sell the club and put the proceeds into a charity that would benefit all victims of the war in Ukraine. These new sanctions bring an end to that plan, as they effectively freeze his assets and prohibit him from any transactions with UK individuals and businesses. The government officials acknowledged that this would impact the soccer community, saying that they are taking steps to protect it. Nadine Dorries, the culture secretary, tweeted, We have been working hard to ensure the club and the national game are not unnecessarily harmed by these important sanctions. So we have a few questions to answer here. Who owns Chelsea right now? What happens with the other Russian assets being seized around the world? And what happens with Russian financial assets that Westerners may own that have stopped trading due to the new sanctions? Before I answer those questions, let me tell you quickly about today's video sponsor, Morning Brew. As my regular viewers know, I consume a lot of news content, and Morning Brew is a fantastic way to get up to speed first thing in the morning. Instead of aimlessly browsing social media, sign up for Morning Brew. It's a totally free daily newsletter, which is delivered Monday through Sunday. They get you up to speed on business, finance and tech news in around five minutes each day. It's become one of my favourite news sources. There's been some great coverage of the effects of these economic sanctions in Morning Brew over the last week. I can't recommend it enough. Sign up using the link in the description below. OK, so the sanctions that Western governments have imposed on Russia in the wake of this invasion are the most restrictive sanctions ever imposed against a major economic power. So to a certain extent, a lot of this is unprecedented. The measures target Russia's financial system, the assets of powerful Russian individuals and Russian oil and gas assets, and they're designed to punish Putin and the influential Russians who both support and depend on him, making it close to impossible to conduct business as normal in Russia. In the short term, that means a massive economic slowdown in Russia. And we are seeing just that. The Russian stock market has been shuttered since the invasion, and many Russian companies with shares listed abroad have seen their equity values all but wiped out. The Russian ruble, which plunged as the war began and sanctions were rolled out, is now near an all-time low. Putin and 11 other top Russian government officials have been hit personally with sanctions by the US Treasury Department. Their names have been added to the specially designated nationals list, effectively meaning that any assets owned by them and held in the global financial system are frozen and Americans are legally prohibited from doing business with those individuals. 
Several Russian oligarchs are also facing sanctions, and the US Justice Department and some European law enforcement agencies are working to confiscate non-financial assets like real estate and yachts from those billionaires. The financial sanctions go well beyond individuals. The US has placed sanctions on Russia's central bank and immobilized the reserves it held in the US financial system. The European Union put in place similar sanctions, meaning that it's been impossible for Russia to use its reserves to defend the ruble or to make purchases to further the war effort. Notably, the Swiss government has also said that it will drop its long-held neutral stance and join in the sanctions by freezing Russian assets, including bank accounts. Governments that have seized the yachts and homes of Russian oligarchs or frozen the assets of Russia's central bank now face a more difficult question. What do they do with them? The US president warned Russian oligarchs, We're joining with European allies to find and seize their yachts, their luxury apartments, their private jets. We're coming for you, ill-begotten gains. Officials impounded a 213-foot yacht in Imperia, Italy, a 280-foot yacht in France, and an $18 million resort compound in Sardinia, all owned by Russian oligarchs. But freezing the assets is the simple part. Deciding what to do with them is more challenging and will likely start court battles that drag on for decades. Laws vary by country, but generally sanctions don't allow countries to simply take ownership of private property. Under the sanctions announced by the US and Europe, members of the Russian elite who enriched themselves at the expense of the Russian people and aided Putin in his invasion of Ukraine will have their assets frozen and their property blocked from use. But assets that are frozen do still remain under the ownership of the sanctioned individual. They just can't be transferred or sold. Russian oligarchs will continue to own their yachts, but they'll be secured by national authorities and prevented from being used or from sailing to safer locations. To actually take ownership of property, government prosecutors have to prove the property was part of a crime. Under US civil forfeiture law, an asset used to commit a crime or that represents the proceeds of illegal activity can be seized but only with a warrant. The government has to prove both the crime and the connection of the property to that crime, and doing so may be difficult. The oligarchs will of course have good lawyers who will make arguments that they acted reasonably within the laws that were in place in Russia and that no criminal activity occurred. Proving criminality like this can take years. The US helped retrieve more than $300 million stolen from Nigeria by the former military dictator Sani Abacha after more than five years of proceedings. A case against former Ukrainian Prime Minister Pavlo Lazarenko, who was convicted in the US of money laundering, dragged on for more than 15 years due to Lazarenko's well-funded defense. A government can potentially take ownership only if a prosecutor can prove a crime, prove the connection of the asset to the crime, and the identity of the owner. And Russian oligarchs are not new to the world of asset protection. They use shell companies, trusts, offshore jurisdictions, and a web of family members and associates to hide the true owner of many of these assets. Liz Trust, the UK Foreign Secretary, promised another wave of sanctions once an economic crime bill comes into law. The bill, fast-tracked through Parliament, will make it easier for the government to apply sanctions and make them harder to challenge. The bill puts forth three key proposals. Establishing a register of overseas owners of UK property, strengthening the unexplained wealth order regime, and strengthening the civil financial sanctions regime. But the bill is filled with loopholes. Overseas ownership rules, for example, can be bypassed by the property being held by a UK nominee or by owning your offshore company in equal shares with five close relatives so that no individual shareholder reaches the 25% ownership level required to count as a person of significant control. 
With regard to Chelsea, the UK government issued a special license to the club on Thursday from the Office of Financial Sanctions Implementation. According to the license, Chelsea can't sell any more tickets for games, they can't sell team merchandise, and they won't be able to buy or sell players on the transfer market. Games can, however, go ahead, staff can be paid, and existing ticket holders are allowed to attend matches. Existing player transfer agreements and broadcasting deals with Chelsea can go ahead, and the team can spend money to travel to games, but that's capped at £20,000 per game. Most importantly, if you are attending a match, you can buy refreshments under this license, even though that involves giving money to a sanctioned entity. Basically, the British can't be expected to put up with not being allowed to buy a beer at a football game, no matter where the money goes. These rules allow football fans to see their team play while, as Nadine Doris, the Secretary for Culture, put it, depriving Abramovich of benefiting from his ownership of the club. Dory's acknowledged that this development brings some uncertainty, but promised the government would keep working with clubs and the league to keep them in play. Football clubs are cultural assets and the bedrock of our community, she added. We're committed to protecting them. So governments can't just seize property from individuals without going through the courts. And as we've said, sanctions are more about freezing assets than taking ownership of them, which can only be done if you can prove that they're ill-gotten gains. In theory, the sanctions are temporary and the frozen assets will eventually be returned. Some might argue that letting the team run as normal without passing any money onto Abramovich would work as well. But if that happened and the business generated wealth, which would eventually be passed on to the owner once the asset was unfrozen, it's not really much of a punishment to the owner. It's not like Abramovich was relying on Chelsea for his income anyhow. The sanctioning bodies don't want him to accrue wealth, even inaccessible wealth, while he's sanctioned. So we end up with this situation where the business can operate, but it has to operate badly. The long-run expectation is probably that the frozen businesses would slowly collapse, and to avoid this the various oligarchs would pressure Putin to end the war. The likely outcome of this is that Abramovich will negotiate a sale which does not benefit him financially. The sanctions can't take the business away from him, but they can have the same overall effect. Shares in Evraz, the London-listed steel company, where Roman Abramovich is the largest shareholder, were also suspended on Thursday. The company is accused by the UK government of having been involved in supplying steel to the Russian military, which may have been used in the production of tanks. That leads us to the final question of what will likely happen to the stocks and bonds issued by Russian companies that foreign investors currently own. A large group of global investors, from pension plans to hedge funds to sovereign wealth funds, down to private individuals, hold Russian assets that were worth almost $170 billion at the end of 2021. Moscow's equity markets are currently suspended and trading in many Russian companies listed abroad is halted. Russian bonds are almost impossible to trade right now. That leaves investors facing the prospect of deep losses. There are all sorts of complications around these securities that will likely take years to work their way through the court systems around the world. In extreme situations, when a country faces significant political or economic uncertainties, it's not unheard of for a stock exchange to temporarily shut down to limit the damage from panic selling. In the midst of the Greek debt crisis in 2015, the Athens stock market was shut down for five weeks. During the mass protests of the Arab Spring back in 2011, the Egyptian stock market was closed for nearly two months. It's hard to say when or if trading will resume in many of these assets, and a lot depends on how the Russia-Ukraine negotiations pan out and how long the Western sanctions stay in effect. It could be weeks or even years before investors can access their funds in Russian companies again. 
While it's nearly impossible to trade Russian stocks right now, many index and active funds will likely bring further selling pressure once the market reopens. And that's because MSCI and FTSE Russell, two of the major index providers, said earlier this week that they would remove Russian stocks from their widely followed emerging markets indices. That means all the funds that replicate these indexes or use them as a guide with trillions of dollars in assets would need to follow that change and unload their Russian holdings. Although Russia only accounted for a small slice of the emerging markets benchmarks, the sheer amount of assets in the affected funds could bring a new round of selling for Russian stocks. People who were short Russian stocks find themselves in a strange position too. While they're sitting on gains given the collapse in Russian stocks, they can't actually exit their positions until trading reopens, and they're paying expensive stock borrow rates, in some cases as high as 20%, on positions that they can't close out. Russian government dollar bonds that are due to be repaid in 2027 are now trading at 8 cents on the dollar. A default may come as soon as April 15th this year, which will mark the end of a 30-day grace period if payments worth $107 million due next week are missed. While extremely likely, a default on these bonds is not guaranteed. Gazprom successfully made payment on a dollar-denominated bond this week. There's also a chance that some of Russia's frozen overseas assets, including the hundreds of billions of dollars in foreign reserves, could be impounded to repay defaulted debt. And there is the hotly debated question of whether payment in rubles on dollar debt constitutes a default. The bond prospectuses for Russia's sovereign securities are quite unusual. They lack a waiver of sovereign immunity, and while they're nominally governed by UK law, they don't appear to submit to a jurisdiction. If Russia fails to pay, it's unclear how the country could be taken to court. Another thing that's not obvious at all right now is how credit default swaps will work with regard to Russian debt. You typically turn in the bonds that have been defaulted upon to receive a CDS payment, but right now those bonds are not transferable, possibly providing a loophole for CDS sellers. We've also seen a lot of news about international companies who own stakes in Russian joint ventures who no longer want to own them, but they're not really able to sell them either. BP and Equinor have talked about selling or just writing down these assets on their balance sheets. Citigroup, who've been trying to sell their Russian retail bank for over a year now, are stuck in legal limbo, raising the odds that they'll have to wind down the operation. On top of this, Putin has warned international companies that have halted operations in Russia that he could seize their assets following the exodus of big Western brands such as McDonald's and Unilever. It's easy to believe that this economic assault will bring the Russian economy to a screeching halt, but a badly damaged economy can still stagger along in a diminished state for quite a while. We've seen this already with places like Iran, Venezuela and North Korea. For sanctions to work as intended, Western governments need to lay out clear conditions for the removal of sanctions to encourage de-escalation and an end to the war. It's not yet clear what outcome would be considered acceptable to end the sanctions, either the official sanctions or the voluntary actions taken by businesses that now range from Visa to McDonald's. Anyway, I hope you found this interesting. Don't forget to sign up for Morning Brew using the link in the description below. It's totally free, so there's no reason not to give it a try. If you missed this video, you should watch it next. See you again soon. Bye.